series of events uh, centering on language preservation and education. Um, I'd also like to welcome our esteemed guests, Dr. Peter Wilson um, and Dr. Kawanoe Kamana, who are joining us from Hawaii. And thank you for coming in the winter time. Um, and also, Tony Johnson, who is a Chinook tribal member, linguist, and artist. So welcome to all of you. Um, Yana's going to give more formal introductions in a little bit, but I just want to uh, say a few things about the event series and just tell you uh, a couple of things about our host sponsors and thanks to folks. So I promise to be brief. Uh, the Indigenous Peoples in the Americas uh, is an event series designed to showcase a number of issues important to the study and celebration of our Indigenous heritage in the Americas. As the Americas and globalized world big ideas suggest, Rather than understanding indigenous history and culture as peripheral to the history of the West, indigeneity is central to our conceptions of the Americas and indeed the world, as tonight's event underscored very nicely. Uh, for these reasons, the Americas and the Globalized World the Big Idea is devoting an entire year to promoting uh, events centered on indigenous peoples. We are very glad to have events that cover a range of disciplines and perspectives including language preservation, indigenous education, poetry, visual art, and environmental issues. Um, I know that everybody is anxious to get underway, but before we begin, there are a number of people I want to thank and make sure that we acknowledge uh, in putting this event together. So first, I'd like to thank uh, the wonderful staff at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies, Eli Meyer, the assistant director, who has worked tirelessly to make this event happen in the last couple of weeks. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, our crack team of graduate teaching fellows, Jim Kohler, Heather Wolford, and Kate, Bar Kate Barris, and Heather, Feather Crawford Free. Um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Feather and Kate, who worked a lot over the summer to make sure that this event would happen. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Underrunner, who has been the primary organizer of this event, and without her, this would not be happening. So, uh, thank you very much for your hard work on this. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge Lynn Stephen, who is uh, on sabbatical this year, but who is the, uh, was the director of class for me, and also Carlos Aguirre, who has provided a tremendous amount of leadership with the America's Big Idea. Um, and then finally, I'd like to mention our our co-sponsors, so I'm just going to sort of read along. So the College of Arts and Sciences, the Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity, the Center for the Study of Women in Society, the Department of English, the Department of Ethnic Studies, the Northwest Indian Language Institute, the Clark Honors College, the Latin American Studies Program, the Department of Education Studies, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Linguistics, and the Department of Romance Languages. Thanks to all of you for helping us to make this event happen. Uh, I don't want to take any more of your time, but I do want to let you know about a couple of other events that are coming up. So starting on uh, October, well actually starting next week, uh, Juan Noel, who is a Spanish and English multilingual poet, is going to be giving a reading as uh, a part of another of our events, uh, Spanish, Spain, and Latin America through contemporary poetry. So that's going to be happening next Thursday, October 13th from 4 to 5.30 in the Berlinger Lounge. So we'll be sure to check that out. And then also, uh, on October 26th, we have a very exciting exhibit coming to the George Center Museum of Art. Um, and that's going to be, actually, it's not there, I like. Uh, I'm going to tell you the real place. It is at, in the EMU Fur Room. I'm sorry, even better. Uh, EMU Fur Room. And it's uh, a Chiapas photography project exhibit and lecture titled Our Mirror, A Mirror to, the, to Our World by the Mayan artist and author from Bogotá's blog game. And again, that's going to be Wednesday, October 26th at 3 p.m. in the EMU program. And then last uh, but not least, there is an email sign-up sheet if you would like to receive more information on class and America's Big Ideas events. So uh, where is that? Is that going to circulate? Okay. okay. So it will circulate, and you can sign up for that, and you get it back together uh, by the end of the event. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Yana, who's going to our guests more formally, and uh, thank you very much for coming today.
carrier of Chinook Wall, who he learned from his elders. He's from Willapa Bay, which he'll maybe even show you some pictures of in uh, southern, the bay comes in, southern Washington area. And uh, Tony's artwork actually is exhibited in many places in the Northwest, including the Port of Portland. He's a carver. He's a metalsmith, has his degree from Eastern Central Washington. Central Washington and metalsmithing. He's a printmaker. He's a father of five children. He speaks Chinookwawa at home to his children. His children do not hear English spoken to them. I feel that he is the person that is responsible for revitalizing Chinookwawa in the Northwest. He would never say that. But he has been the teacher for all of us. He's been the inspiration for all of us and has tired endured to have Chinookwawa be spoken again in the Northwest. And so, I could go on and on and on about Tony Johnson, and I will let him come up and say more to you. But, I also want to say that, before you do, <laughs> I do, I also want to point out that, that Tony really has helped uh, start the Northwest Indian Language Institute. The Northwest Indian, Indian Language Institute came together in 1997 when the tribes came here to the UVO and said to us, us being the linguists that I am, a number of us that had been working in the communities, documenting language, writing language curriculum, helping get language programs started. And the tribes said, you know, You've taken a lot from us, and it's time to give back. And so we had a two-day gathering of tribes from the Northwest and listened to what they wanted from us. And what they really wanted was guidance, guidance in training their younger second language learners. Languages in their communities to be teachers and to develop curriculum materials for teaching. And Tony really led that with Virginia Beaver, who's also here, Gal, and folks from Warm Springs who were to me and, and tell me that. And that first year we started the Northwest Indian Language Institute that summer, which still continues every year. Tony's our chair our advisory board here at the University of Oregon, and I look to him for his direction, as well as others, but certainly to him for what it is that we are to be doing. And so I, I feel like I owe him a lot, and I'm grateful, very grateful that he's in my life and that I can call him a friend and, and colleague, and certainly an inspiration.
96. That's a greeting from my dad's grandmother. This is the way that she said that we're to address a group of people. Two of them, people, Kai, the people of status, rank, shik, our close friends. Two of kind of means family, along with people in this case. But there's more, that is, she would say, and then my dad would argue with me or tell me that it, I have to say this, but I'm going to abbreviate it just to tell you that this grandmother that I'm referring to, her name was uh, Lizzie Pickernell, and her mother was Margaret Perot, whose mother was Ecclesic, and whose mother and father were Oskalo and Akansi. Oskalo, which was a treaty site for Cunha, Dan, Cunha tribe from Oak Point on the Columbia River. And uh, Margaret Arrow's husband was John Pickernell, Julia, whose mother was Conlon, whose mother was Tate who lived in the house of Pum Pum, the, the treaty signer for, uh, for the Lord Chinooks. These are just parts of our genealogy, but we're, when we stand up in front of you, we're supposed to explain why it is we have a right to talk to you. So that's an abbreviated version of why I'm standing here speaking to you. You want to say how nice it is to see a lot of you. It's uh, really good. I know many of you and the rest of you, I'm happy to be here and be speaking uh, to you. I think regardless of what I say tonight, it's not going to, uh, well, it's going to pale in comparison to the people that come after us. I really believe that truly. Uh, you know, it's a real honor and a privilege that you have them here and that they're going to be here for the days coming. I just hope everybody takes advantage of, listens really well whatever it is to the teaching that they have to share. And uh, with that, I'm just going to say a few things about, a little bit about <laughs> me and my experiences. And uh, hopefully it paints a bit of a picture about the status of languages in the Northwest and, uh, and some of the work that's happening and really the poor situation that we're in with our languages and our culture and, you know, I mean, it is a very, uh, well, we're in a state of emergency, how's that, I mean, I don't know how to say it, but it, it can't be overset how, you know, dramatic or what have you, how bad of a situation really we've come to be in. There's fantastic people doing fantastic work to try to fix that, but it is really, uh, uh, a dire situation. And one of the teachings of one of my elders was that you can't fix a problem in less time than it took to make it. And, you know, I always liked that teaching because everybody wants a quick fix in this here world. But uh, that is a real strong belief. And, uh, you know, it tells you that, you know, there's been a lot of good work happening, but there's a lot of work ahead of us. We know that we've got a lot of work to do to get to where we were when this problem started. So, just in saying something about myself, by the way, the baby is uh, our number is number five. And uh, that's her name too, her middle name is Buena. <laughs> Buena is uh, number five. That's a sacred number to us uh, from the lower Columbia River and a big deal to us to have a fifth baby here. So anyway, if she cries, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is a picture, by the way, of near Pillar Rock on the Columbia River. Very few people ever go down there because there's not a lot in the, you know, there's just not a road along that stretch of the river. It's kind of, you know, east of Astoria on the north shore. This is us in one of our canoes. And this is one of the things that really compels my family is we own uh, canoes. We've been involved in making canoes. And uh, we travel every year by canoe on the canoe journey. But this is just us traveling in our own home waters near, uh, near Pillar Rock. The 
This is us in Cassie's territory. That's uh, the Skamakwe is the name of the town, place on the Columbia River where the, the road turned away from the river. I'm really not spending time on this. I just, this is, uh, I'm a carver, as was said, and this, this Columbia River style art is also an endangered thing and something that uh, we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about and working on um, and something we want to see. Just like, you know, it, all of this is tied together in the end. The canoe culture. Uh, you know, was something that was basically lost. We had some really famous canoe makers in our community pretty recently. One of them is a man named Josie George, really well-known man. He married a auntie of my wife's, but he, he switched to making boats, and he's a very famous boat maker through, uh, really through the early part of the 1900s. But, uh, you know, people still are really proud of owning these Josie George boats, and it's just, you know, something something to know, I guess. But a lot of people have heard of him, and he used indigenous technology in making these boats. I mean, making any kind of boat somebody wanted, but he never drove a nail. He always pegged everything. He, you know, he made them uh, with the same sensibilities that he learned about canoe making as a young spirit. So again, this stuff is really all... Uh, all part of the same thing to me. Um, by the way, so those doors are at the Port of Portland in the new building at the airport in Portland. So you can actually go see that stuff. They call that their Chinook Room, which is uh, kind of cool. And the Commission Room is what we carved, the two sets of double doors and did a number of artwork for them. This is at Portland State University. Um, this is uh, Hakum. Hakum was one of my teachers. She's uh, Phil, Philip Hawks, the hereditary chief from the village where I'm from. Our main, our main Chinook town in Willapa Bay. Well, there's two, two native towns today, uh, Nam Piayak and Nam uh, Nam Piayak is Bay Center. And uh, this woman's son is the hereditary chief today of the village at Bay Center. He's a tribal council member for the Chinook tribe. He is a very unique individual. He was raised, uh, oh, there she is. <laughs> This man I'm talking about, he just had a birthday, 75 years old, and it's kind of a young man to have the experience he had in his life because he's the last Chinook to be born at the actual village uh, down the hill. The, the town moved up on the hill, but the original village is down on the point. That's where these folks are here, this picture of her. She's gathering sweet grass. That's our main basket tree grass from the uh, mouth of Columbia River. And Anyway, uh, you know, I, I'm just I'm showing her as an inspiration to me and a, a teacher of mine. I spent quite a lot of time in her living room. Just uh, cool, you like them in there. But you know, just just learning. I was gonna say it later. I'll probably say it again. But I was a weird kid. So being a weird kid, I guess is okay. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but. As a, as a teenager, for whatever reason, it was really obvious to me that there were no other kids around that were learning the things that these old timer, old time people were talking about or doing. You know, that, that was just painfully obvious to me as a kid. And so, probably my real inspiration in what I ended up doing, which is at one time when I spent my time with Mostly with uh, Hakum, I actually dropped out of college. I didn't really drop out. I took time off, and my tribe was paying me through. We tip or whatever.
Wex or JTV or something like that to just do a little bit of this work, but it's just what I wanted to be doing. So, you know, went back home from the University of Washington and was just spending my time with, with these folks. And I really, anything that I have to say here is credited to them. I don't, you know, the only credit I'll take is being hard-headed and trying to push, keep pushing this stuff forward. But any information I have is from these people. Um, yeah. So the reality is, I think I said that there's no language in the Northwest that's flourishing, no indigenous language. There are some languages in better shape than others, but you know there are there's no language. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Pacific Northwest, indigenous language where there's natural language learning happening on a large scale, you know, where there's, you know, parents raising their kids in the language. The reality is, and I think all the folks here that I know know this, is that this information is mostly all in the minds of our elders. And then there are a few younger folks, some of them here in the room, <laughs> that uh, are you, can you be a younger folk? <laughs> but younger people who are, you know, uh, have been motivated like this to to learn as second language speakers, or we've had the good fortune of being exposed to the language, and then you know work hard to learn enough to to be doing the work they're doing. Something to say is so I'm saying not any of our languages are flourishing. But many of our languages are, are dead. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you know. I mean, I hate to say it that way. That's a hard way to say it. It's a hard thing to say to ourselves. But the uh, Fualnish language, the Haku here, she's named in Chinook. That's a Chinook name, but uh, old ancestral name. But her language that she spoke as a child and she spoke through is a uh, Fualnish. And that language died with these grandmas and grandpas. So what I don't have a picture of is a man named Sato Anu. I named him in my speaking at the beginning. But Sato Anu was uh, the last fluent speaker of uh, Paul. And uh, he spoke five languages. And that's something else to say that was typical about our ancestors. They spoke many languages. Today in America you speak, we get to speak English, but that's not the way it was. And there was value for our ancestors to know these languages, to know more languages. The farther you could communicate, the more, you know, there's, there was so much advantage to that. Not to mention almost all of our people in the Northwest, certainly where I'm from, wanted to marry outside of your community. You couldn't marry anybody that you were perceived to be related to. So you always, you know, kids were always raised in households, in my territory anyway, where somebody spoke Chehalis. This uh, Fualtmish language is Lower Chehalis. But where people spoke that, or Tilemuk, the Til you know, Tilemuk language, or Lower Chinook, or an Upper Chinook language, or Kauli. Just some language from, you know, many, some many languages from the area. And our houses, you know, what a thing it must have been to see the big long houses that we had where there was truly grandmothers and grandfathers speaking everything from Macaw, you know, down to something in Coos Bay and all the way up the Columbia River, you know, just the, all these languages were flourishing in that situation. Um, Tony Lucier, that's who I'm named after, by the way, that's where I get the name, is uh, the man I'm naming, Sato Anu. And uh, Sato Anu uh, was also a fluent speaker of Chinook Wallow. And uh, his mother was a very famous informant for us. She spent a lot of time with the linguists and anthropologists. People know her as Emma Lucier, her name's Sato. But she uh, refused to speak English to Tony, to Satavana. And that was unusual for the time. She just wouldn't speak English to him. And uh, 
This is why he ended up speaking five languages. And he and my grandfather were best friends. I never knew my grandpa. He died in a car when my dad was young. But Tony, uh, I think because of that and his connection to my grandfather, treated me a lot like his mother treated him. He always spoke Indian to me. It's not to say he never spoke English to me, but he spoke a lot. And it's where I really became uh, able to speak Chinookwawa. Chino he also spoke Tualatin to me. And I'm ashamed to say that I didn't learn that language. Um, yeah, I just didn't learn it. I know some of it, little bits, formulaic expressions, as we'd say, I guess, you know. But I can't really make the language work. Something, uh, something of benefit to me is that I now work, and I'm going to say something about my work in Grand Round, but I now work for the Shoalwater Bay Indian Tribe, which is actually just kind of a uh, group, you know, related to, to Chinook, my community of Chinook. My wife's enrolled at Shoalwater Bay. Uh, Shoalwater Bay is just one square mile reservation and then kind of in the middle of our territory. And uh, it's on the north end of the territory, kind of where we had a mix between uh, our Chinook folks and more of Fualtonish speakers. So the Fualtonish language really flourished at, uh, at Georgetown or Nonspot, this village at the Shoalwater Bay Reservation. And so I'm getting to spend much more time with that language now, and that pleases me to, to be able to do. So I should say something, I guess, that, and you know, just big picture stuff is, uh, you know, why is it important, or why should it be important that these languages actually have a life? because the reality is there's been a lot of generations of Americans who did not have an interest in seeing these languages live. You know, there's been systematic efforts to take away our languages. And, you know, you've all heard probably about Indian boarding schools. You've had our own family members make decisions that there wasn't value in it. In the case of, uh, of Lower Chinook and uh, Kathlam, uh, it, in our community, it almost, they almost exclusively died for Fawaltonish because our neighbors didn't speak Chinookin, but we almost all spoke Salish. And so we had a lot more, we could do more with the, with the Salish language that we knew than we could with the uh, Chinookin. So most of the Chinook folks, the last generation of real fluent speakers, uh, Hakum being one, uh, they mostly spoke Fawaltan, even if they weren't Lord Chehalis by blood. My uh, grandmother spoke Lord Chehalis, but was not Lord Chehalis. She was Upper Chehalis, but she's mostly Chinook. But she ended up speaking Lord Chehalis because that was a, the community language. Um, so languages have passed for any number of reasons, but there really has been work to to get rid of these languages. And there's people here who could speak much more eloquently about that than I could. But, you know, I think it's worth saying, again, why is it important? You know, what, why is it important? And a, a big part of why it's important that may not matter to everybody, but matters really strongly to me, and I know a lot of the people in this room, is that knowing your language really does something for the way people feel about themselves. You know, that whether you want to call it self-esteem, whatever it is, you know, we know, and I think you you all in Hawaii have some experience with that. that the kids that are speaking their language are, you know, flourishing in a different way. And that's something that we know uh, to be true. Um, the people, the fluent speakers, the people that I'm kind of holding up or naming here that I've known, and I'll name many of them from Grand Round, 
especially I'll name the Hudson sisters and I'll name Isla Dowd as an elder that I spent a great deal of time with there in Grand Round. Uh, these folks are some of the kindest and best people I've known in my life. Virginia, I'll put you in that. You know, just really, there's something built into these languages and the, our culture, our ancestral culture, that, uh, that you know, it, it just breeds a different way of looking at each other and looking at the world. And in America, the idea, for instance, that you can't lie is a joke. Everybody in America lies. That's what it is. It, you know, I mean, this is the truth. Well, you know, even just a little lie. But the people I'm talking about, lying wasn't really an option exactly for them. And I know that's hard to believe, but it's just not something that, you know, it's not a common practice. It's something that's built into the way that we are. That that's not an, it's really, I mean, we all say don't lie, but this was the real deal, or this is the real deal. You know, they, in some cases, couldn't even conceive of it. Um, and of course, I mean, people care about this area we live in, this world we live in, this environment we live in, and you can't say enough about the knowledge. You know, Americans, Europeans, whatever, have just scratched the surface of the actual information that is in this, in our world here, you know, this place, in the dirt, in the water, in the grass, whatever it is. These languages grew up with this place, I mean, they're given to us tens of thousands of years ago, and the, you know, all the knowledge of our ancestors, and these things are built into the language. I. We just lost an elder. We uh, buried him on Saturday. Well, I sat with him many times talking to him about any number of things, but one thing that I'll never forget is we sat on the Nema River, the middle Nema River, and he talked to me about each of our species of salmon that we have in the river and how it was when he was a kid and every little preference that they have in the water. You know, these fish, how they pair off, where it is exactly that they want to be, whether it's a riffle or a hole or, you know, the shade, the light, or whatever, how it was that they, you know, were when they came to the river. All the information that, you know, we've been, he's inherited for really thousands of years of information that he inherited about these fish. The same day we sat with the man that was a PhD came to New York to visit these folks called the Little Paw Alliance, people trying to preserve our bay, and he held up a fish in the river and said, as it's dripping eggs down, he's talking about this male fish that's literally dripping eggs down. You know, this is a man with a PhD and is supposed to really know what he's talking about, about our fish and our rivers and our whatever he's talking about it as a buck or something. Yeah. And we're just, you know, we're all shaking our heads at this. But, you know, the point is there is no comparison to the knowledge that, you know, we've inherited or that these languages hold. And, you know, much of that's been lost, but we need to preserve what we have. You know, the knowledge that's there, it has to be preserved. This is a picture Maybe not very interesting, you know, Grand Round. Uh, as Yana said, I went to work in Grand Round in 1997, and I, at that time I was the only person my age who could really speak Chinook uh, there. Uh, there was something there that there wasn't in my community, and that was there was a group of elders that were using the language regularly. They may not use it for everything in their lives, but you could go sit down with them and speak, and you could sit with sisters that would sit and spend their time talking in Chinookwawa. And, you know, so this was a really great thing for me. I was able to learn a variety of the language there. And uh, these are just some nice pictures of folks. 
The kids in this picture, by the way, are some of the sisters that I have the benefit of spending my time with in Grand Round. The dog's name is Bounce. I was, Isla Dow told me I had to always say that when I saw this picture to tell people her dog's name was Bounce. <laughs> Name in Grand this is a Hylas grandmother. So, I want to say something about Grand Round, and that is that uh, the Grand Round tribe was terminated by the federal government, so were all the tribes in Western Oregon and Klamath in Central Eastern, well, Central Southern Oregon. They were all terminated. When, when, and that means that you know the tribes have a relationship with the federal government, uh, government to government relationship, a trust responsibility from the federal government to the tribes. I mean, you can describe it any way you want, but that was terminated in the 1950s in several places, uh, Grand Ram or Western Oregon across the board. Um, so these folks uh, were terminated. The only land that the tribe retained was the five acres there. I won't dwell on it, but the five acres of the cemetery. That was the only land they maintained of from what was a 64,000 acre reservation. These folks, I'm just showing you them, uh, they're the three people responsible for uh, bringing the tribe back. Really. They uh, worked tirelessly. Catherine Harrison. This is Catherine at Jamawa, which I'll leave for now. Bakaman. So, Chinookwawa is a uh, uh, contact language, really. I mean, that's its origins. I guess that's how we'll will say it, and when I say contact in the way that I learned about its history, not contact between Europeans and Indians, but uh, between Indians that couldn't otherwise speak the, speak each other's language. And it really, you know, so we have a class of languages called the pidgin, pidgin languages or pidgin creole languages. A pidgin language, some of you, maybe all of you know, this, but that's really how Chinook started. I mean, it was a reduced form of Chinookan. And it's 55% or so of the language as we speak it now is exactly how it comes out of the Lower Chinook language from the mouth of Columbia River that the Clatsop people and the Lower Chinook people spoke. So that's, you know, that's what it was, basically a reduction of, of the language that would allow for communication between adults that didn't otherwise have a common language. It had a very wide usage. You know, in the past, if you saw somebody that you didn't know and had no expectation of them knowing your language, this is what you spoke to them. Well, in the context of places like Grand Round or Willapa Bay, where we ended up with more people together, and that's because of an 1851 treaty negotiation where uh, the largest reservation that Anson Dart was trying to establish for the Chinook folks and Tillamook folks and Lord Jayla's folks at the mouth of Columbia River was going to be in Willapa Bay. People came there with a certain expectation. But in places like that where you have multiple languages being used, uh, Chinook flourished. Fort Vancouver is another really good example where we have a person that went through Fort Vancouver in the 1830s and wrote down all the languages that he heard spoken there. And he names, you know, everything from the languages of Eastern Canada, because a lot of those folks that came, you know, they worked for the Hudson Bay Company, the Odawa, the Mohawks, the Cree, they worked for Hudson Bay Company, they moved out here, they were speaking their languages. Scottish, French, you know, Welsh, whatever it is, these languages from Europe, uh, and then all the local, you know, Kalapuya, Kalis, Chinook, 
uh, all these languages, everything being spoke there at Port Vancouver. Well, uh, the the person that's noting this in the 1830s says, and all of them spoke Chinook. And what what else he says? That's a telling thing. Is that he says, and the kids better than anyone. And what that really tells you is the language was becoming what it is for us now, which is a Creole, I mean a language that was taken by the kids. They took this pidgin language and they used it every day of their lives because they were living in households where, like in Grand Round, one parent's a Kalapuya, one's a Moala. The only language that those parents had that they fell in love with, that they raised their kids in, whatever in their house, was Chinook. That's what they spoke just like at Fort Vancouver or Chompuy, any number of places around the Northwest, this language uh, had, you know, became that. And so that's the language as we've inherited it. It's, you know, an indigenous Creole language. And it's very unique for that. Uh, but what is true about that is the people that did that, that made those decisions, the first people that made the decisions to translate the language from, uh, or take the language from Chinookan and reduce it down to a pidgin were Chinook speakers. The people that kind of brought it back up into this other status of a Creole were almost always natives. And so the sensibilities of their languages, their culture, whatever it is, came, you know, have been translated well in the language, as we've learned it anyway. But like anywhere else, these folks, this is Clara Riggs, this is Isla Dowd on the left or the right that I already named, and Maha, her sister Maha. Uh, this is Wilson Bob, who I think Virginia probably knew Wilson there. Uh, this is him in Yakima, actually, Wilson. Uh, you know, these folks were like what we're saying, the last people that were fluent speakers that were raised every day in this language, in their language. So like the rest of our local Northwest languages, it's been really suffering. Uh, so what do you do about that? Well, in my case, and working for Grand Round, they wanted to build a language program and do something about it. Uh, they didn't know what, but want to do something. Uh, we looked around and we uh, saw what the Maoris were doing in New Zealand, which is creating the, a you know, this language nest concept. And then in turn we looked to uh, Hawaii. And the people there taking inspiration from their own experiences and from New Zealand. That's true, correct? So, you know, and they're what I did in reading what was happening uh, in Polynesia, I guess for lack of a better way to say it, was, you know, so much fantastic philosophy around the giving back of the languages to the kids. You know, there's, and I, you know, I'm not going to quote it, um, but they'll say it better than I ever could say it, but you know, the, the ideas of how to give your language back to your kids, how to feed it to them directly. And uh, so, you know, really what that meant to us is language immersion. I mean, that's really what it is, language immersion. Actually using your language every day, oh boy, every day in a natural way uh, with your kids. Kilai Kumna Manka Michelle. Uh, but you know, using your language in a natural way with your kids. In the context of Grand Round, we hired a couple of people who had exposure already to the language from parents or grandparents. I see I screwed it up, I've got it playing on a loop now. But anyway, that, that should mean I'll go as fast as the slide. Though. <laughs> Basically, we were able to hire some folks with exposure to the language and uh, teach them in the context of some of the elders we had left. Myself, a man named Henry Zank, who is a linguist, who is also a very fluent speaker of Chinookwawa, just teach the language 
to these teachers and or better teach the language to them and then in turn create an environment which again is entirely the inspiration of other folks. Uh, I wanna not in a ticky room. So, um, this is what we did. I mean, it's, it's kind of easier said than done, maybe. Right? We're, we're saying this as though this was an easy thing to do. But basically, you know, we saw what other people were doing. The truth is, in this world, we don't know of any other way that people are being able to create fluent speakers of language without immersion. I mean, you can study Spanish, you can study whatever it is in the world, but it's when you go to the country where the language is spoken, or you're living with, or staying with, or whatever speakers of the language. I mean, if my Spanish class had been sent out to repopulate the Spanish-speaking world, I'm afraid to say that we would have done it. We're not a word. We would have, it would be some other language. It would be some other thing. Uh, point, you know. So, we weren't going to... You know, we, we know that. We know that's true. We know that from experience in our own situations, and we know that from what people have uh, taught us. So the answer to it really is something that was created elsewhere that we were able to take, model to our own needs, and uh, you know, create something that ultimately was successful or has been successful. That is, we have been able to in our preschool, take kids in 30 days before they're three years old, speak to them every day, all day, only in, strictly only in Chinookwawa, and in the end, and in relatively short order, have kids that are speaking the language in the same way that they came in speaking English. This is, this is the point of a language nest or you know these immersion schools. There is an example of the Pagan Institute in uh, Browning, Montana, that is another that was really an inspiration. I was able to go visit there, see what they were doing. Jan and I went to go visit, uh, see it. Had the very good fortune of going to uh, Hawaii and seeing what was happening there. So this is just, I mean, just images showing some of what this is. This is the new uh, school in Grand Round. There really was nothing like this when I moved to Grand Round, by the way. But uh, I'm not going to say much about it. But working to create an environment where there's indigenous things to talk about, for one. That's why there's a canoe sitting here or a canoe in Whatever it is, an example of a class. The motivation that we've had in curriculum development, and again, there's so much to say and so little time to do it here, but is culture and place based curriculum through the language. So, always, if we're teaching, it's teaching first about our indigenous sensibility, the, the opinion of our ancestors, whatever it is, as well as we know it, about the things we're teaching first. And of course, you know, we're saying immersion, teaching it in the language. But it meant that we spent a lot of time, uh, or, you know, that they, in Grand Round now, or not me, spend a lot of time on the ground. You know, at the, at the creek, at the beaver dam, at the fish weir, whatever it is, so that, uh, you know, you can use the language fully. So, again, Khartoum. <laughs> that man on the left is uh, Philip Fox, that's Khartoum's son, who's our hereditary chief, and another one of his these are the uh, some of the uh, last uh, Fualtonish speakers from Willapa Bay. And 
I'm leaving, leaving the slides with that. But, uh, you know, there are many people sitting in this room, many of you who I'm talking to that I know very well, who are working on their languages day in, day out. They know that this is not a job that starts or stops. It's just what you have to do. Um, you know, I, my hands are up to, really, to all of you that teach your language. I can't say enough about it, that work on your language. The value of those people here in this room that are investing their lives in it is immeasurable. Typically, the people that are teaching these languages in their communities are underpaid, underappreciated. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, you know, the subject of, you know, a lot of politics or any number of things that happen uh, in communities. And, you know, you can't, you can't say enough about the people here that have invested their lives in it where the rover meets the road, so to speak, right? I mean, it's like, it's the, it's the real deal. And, you know, if there is anything I could have in this world, it's that those people would be held up higher, supported better financially, supported better uh, in terms of their status in their, in their own communities, in the country as a whole. You know, I don't really know how it works. But in Japan, for instance, there is the national treasure system. You know, they have living national treasures. Not really so much about the people as about whatever knowledge they hold. But there's millions of dollars or yens or whatever it is that is obligated to people or to the knowledge itself. You know, there really is no excuse for not having that kind of support uh, for the people here that carry that knowledge. How we get there, I don't know. We get closer, we get more, you know. There is more and more happening for us, but it is so minor compared to what needs to happen. There have been hundreds of years of effort to take the language away and millions and millions of dollars spent to take the languages away. Now we have drops of money infused here or there or whatever to help us but it's nowhere near the effort that was put into taking it away. And so, you know, again, this idea of it takes longer to fix a problem or as long to fix a problem as it take, took to make it, well, I probably gonna take as much energy and money and whatever else that it took to make this problem to fix it too. And so, you know, I don't suspect all of us sitting here have deep pockets or anything else, but these are the things that we need to say to, you know, our lawmakers, to the people we know that do have deep pockets, you know, Neely is hugely valuable what's happening. So many of you that are language teachers, are language carriers, knowledge, whatever it is, have this knowledge, that are sitting here, are here because of Neely. You know, we need, th that needs better support. Our home communities need better support. You know, I don't have an answer for how we do that, but I know if we say that and give it some life and say it over and over again, that it has to help us. So I'm concerned with time, so I think I'm going to leave it at that and introduce our other guests. I think if there are questions after the fact, well, uh, we'll just take them, take them then. Fair enough. So I asked about introducing these uh, two, and they said keep it short. But I really did. I had the good fortune of going to Hawaii, meeting these people, uh, and really changed uh, my entire life in terms of what I was thinking about how to make this language that I had the good fortune of learning how to make it go forward. Um, and that, by the way, is a lot of weight on people's shoulders, and everybody here that speaks or learns or teaches a language here knows that. There's a huge weight on our shoulders to carry it. And there are many people in this room that could probably make a decision to actually see their language go away. 
they could decide themselves in their role or as their, themselves to just not do another thing, and that could be it. That that's how endangered we're talking. But you know, I met these two. Um, you know, they were so kind, so generous. The same things that I was trying to describe in the speakers of the languages that I had the good fortune of being raised around, they had the same feeling about them. The same uh, just wanting to share humility, never saying all the big things, you know. That's an important attribute that I probably didn't mention about the folks I'm talking about and that I, you know, really admire, admire them. So they took me to see the schools, talked to me about their experiences, what works, what doesn't. Uh, you know, we had to go learn it all ourselves anyway, but, uh, you know, had a good path set ahead of us for, by uh, the next folks that are going to speak here. And uh, I went to the preschool, and they may not know it, but I think I cried like a baby. The first time I went to uh, to the preschool there in uh, on the Big Island that they took me to is very emotional as a person that speaks or knows or whatever an indigenous language to see these kids. We'd seen it on video on whatever, but to be there and see it, it's overwhelming. And we've had people do that that come to our classroom uh, in Grand Run, you know, really just have this really emotional response to it because it's fantastic to see it. Because it's, in the case of Chinookwawa, when we were talking to these kids every day or talking to my own kids every day, when they start speaking back, that's the first time in, I, we've ever seen a kid talk this language. It's always been out of the mouths of elders. You know, that's a big deal. So without, I guess, further ado, uh, this is uh, Bila and Kaunoi. Again, I just really I admire them more than I could say. There are not enough words to to uh, introduce them and bring them forward. So with that, please, we're looking forward to it.
of every day. So that's what we like to do. We enjoy figuring it out. And when you enjoy figuring out how to bring language back, it really gives you much joy. And like um, Tony had mentioned, to hear children speak uh, is the big payoff. To hear little babies speak language, again, especially if they're very weak languages, um, it's worth the struggle all the time. So. Um, I'm Kawan Oe, Kawan Oe, this is Pila Wilson, and um, we both work at the University of Hawaii uh, in Hilo, on the big island of Hawaii, and we're part of the faculty there, but uh, more importantly, uh, we're uh, parents of children that uh, we have raised uh, speaking only Hawaiian, and um, our children today are uh, 30 and 28 years old. Uh, and they've only gone to this kind of school. So we stand before you today as parents of children, as second language speakers of Hawaiian. Um, he's howling, he's white, and I'm Hawaiian. And we can do a lot together. <laughs> so we have a short um, um, PowerPoint, and our style usually is kind of both talk when we want to. So if so, that works for you then. And this is, um, we've gone a long way in Hawaii. We started out with very, very few children. We started with the university and then children. Uh, now there's uh, over 2,300 children going to school through Hawaii from preschool to grade 12. We also have, uh, and this is throughout the state, uh, we also have university programs uh, our particular place, we have our own Hawaiian language college where we conduct everything through Hawaiian all the way to graduate school. We do teacher training, and we have a laboratory school. And so Kauai is in charge of the laboratory school. And uh, <coughs> we also, but the key to all this, I think, and more talking to people recently, just today, <laughs> is that we started a nonprofit that we could have language activists control very tightly and we all trust it's very tight so we trust each other and we don't have all lots of voting problems or anything like that and that group always jumps in whenever we try to do something and so um, <coughs> this is um, some of what we're going to show you is from a fundraiser that we have and we've gotten to the point where we can talk to the bankers and all the big weak people so and uh, we got into television, a little bit about white language news. Okay, so we're going to look at it. All right, so you know Kalala Ikikumu. Without our ancestors, we would not be here. So to understand that we are just part, or just a dot in time, moving through time, and that we come from our past and our ancestors, continue and someday we won't be here and then our children continue and their children continue and their children continue. If we remember the order, the simple order and where we are within that order, somehow our decision making is affected by that. Um, so we have here um, some pictures of um, our um, old people, this is during the 1800s. Uh, meeting uh, uh, together and uh, a picture of uh, our land. How many of you have been to Hawaii before? Yeah. Lots of people go to Hawaii. But you don't necessarily hear Hawaiian. I know in Hawaii you see a lot, all of our street signs are, are Hawaiian names and we use a lot of our language locally. Um, so that's something that's unique to Hawaii. You're not going to typically hear people speaking Hawaiian, but more and more over no. the years. Mostly mm -hmm. words, short words. But now it's getting, you might hear it actually. More in the church you hear it? In the church. Yeah, yeah. in churches, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so in the um, 1970s, there was a big cultural uh, rising, awakening, or whatever in Hawaii, we call it the Hawaiian Renaissance. And so you can see one picture up there is canoe, the um, revitalization of long distance voyaging, and hula. And then there's also uh, political things about land and, and various uh, areas. And there were all elders still alive who knew how to do these things and speak Hawaiian. And a lot of people look at Hawaiian thinking that we have a lot of language, but in some ways, even some Northwest tribes have younger native speakers than we have in Hawaii. Uh, the the um, latest ones who grew up really speaking Hawaiian as a peer group language were in the 1920s, except for one really tiny little isolated place. Um, so uh, <clears throat> in the 70s, everybody knew that it's going out, and these older people helped us, you know, like such as Virginia's helping people now, and others have helped. We saw earlier with Tony's presentation. So, going on to the next yeah, picture. Yeah, I think the next picture, uh, maybe this uh, short video, it's about eight minutes long, that was made uh, a couple years ago for a fundraiser that we had for our Punana uh, Leo Schools, our Language Nest uh, nonprofit that we have every year. And um, it gives a good idea of where we are, or where we were at that time with Hawaiian language. So, um, and everyone that's speaking Hawaiian, or Second language speakers, yeah. Um, it has to do with news, getting a one minute news or something like that. Yeah. Well, it's the. Uh, that was our focus. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Hope the song. So um, to give you an idea of what the schools are like, and this is taken mostly in our laboratory school, we have preschool starting age three to um, age, end of preschool, age five, I guess, 11 such schools. Then they go into the public school system where some are streamed to the English school, some are total Hawaiian school. Um, they, everything is in Hawaii until fifth grade. Fifth grade, they have an English language arts class, just like the English school, the same curriculum, and it's in English. And even though the kids have been going to school all in Hawaii, they know English. And the reason they know English is because it's an English-dominant society, and Hawaii is so weak. So that's the first thing that people thought when we started, they will never be able to speak English, and they won't do well in school. And we found that not to be the case that Little kids figure out what other people are talking and somehow learn it. Uh, even if you are an extremist, and we have, we were somewhat extremists ourselves, and but we're we're unmarried, and uh, there are other families that just didn't want anybody to speak English at all to their children, but somehow they learned it. I mean, it's impossible. The majority of the families actually speak only English at home. They don't know. The parents don't know why. We try, we try to teach them, they're required to go to class, but they never quite get up to the level that the children are. <clears throat> um, within the United States, uh, there was mention about the uh, Chinikwawa School in Gagao, also again Institute for Blackfeet. Uh, Mohawks have been doing quite a bit of work mostly here in Canada, though. Uh, the Cherokees in uh, Oklahoma have uh, started a school. Uh, there's also Navajo. There's about two or three schools that have Navajo. Uh, there's uh, Yupik, Central Alaska Yupik, uh, which is an Eskimo language there. In the north, far north, you have another Eskimo language in Yupiaq. They also have a school. Uh, they um, have uh, started schools for Montana Salish. Think, um, Lakota, I heard, just, just starting. So there's quite a few groups now, I'd say about between uh, 10 and 20 uh, different languages now that are doing this. But 
None of them have gone on beyond intermediate school. In Hawaii, we have it all the way through grade 12. And, it's, and um, there's two types. One is totally in Hawaii, such as our laboratory school. And others, they go into a standard English school. They have maybe two courses taught to Hawaii. Um, however, we've discovered that kids have gone only to sixth grade or seventh grade, still speak Hawaiian. I just saw one in the bank. But before we came, we went to the bank, and there was this girl, I didn't recognize her, and we were talking in Hawaii, and I said, I wanted to take some money, and my wife was like, no, and she was smiling, and then she started talking to us in Hawaii, and then oh, no, I recognized her, and said, oh, yes, you were with us till sixth grade, and all, so, um, <clears throat> so they can go to intermediate school and still be able to speak the language, but we want them to go all the way to 12th grade, um, we have something else too, uh, it was very interesting here when we talk about multiple languages. There's only one Hawaiian language, but if you have been to Hawaii, you notice that we have Japanese, Filipino, Puerto Rican, Portuguese, all of that, and they all intermarried into the Hawaiian people. So we have something that we call heritage languages, which are the languages of the immigrant ancestors. So we want, because Hawaiian culture focuses on the family and the ancestors and all, we wanted to be able to honor those parts of their family too. So we um, started a program where we teach Japanese and also Chinese characters, uh, reading Chinese characters in Hawaiian to recognize the East Asian, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and then we uh, started Latin to try to recognize the Portuguese, Puerto Rican, the Spanish side of Filipino, and uh, other European groups. That was the best we could do to try to address that, um, recognize the families. So uh, that was really interesting to see that um, there's also a tradition of, I heard about Chin Kuo, but I didn't think, wow, well, yes, they have people that spoke all these different languages in the same uh, place. So anyway, that's an important thing to recognize the family. Um, as you, shall we move on, Jesse? Yes. Ah, oh, see, we should have. Well, I don't know. Or else maybe we. Um, is there a microphone? Here? A microphone. Yeah. We have a microphone. Because we can put the microphone up there. Microphone. Yeah. You want to hear what it sounds like. But it has, um, another thing that we do is we try to speak quiet at all times, so we have subtitles. So we have subtitles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Victorious together indeed. 25 amazing years and here we are, a re-established system of Hawaiian medium schools, educating whole families in our own Olalo Hawaii, the mother tongue of our land. From infants to preschoolers, 11 sites throughout the state, over 20 K through 12th grade schools on all major islands, multiple bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees, including a teacher education program, all taught entirely through the medium of the Hawaiian language. Thousands of keiki, makua, and ohana have benefited from being a part of this movement and have helped to make it a success. Our graduates are now using their unique experience to further assist in normalizing the Hawaiian language from the corporate world, he vahi mai ka ikea no ka ke komo ana ka olalo Hawaii i loko o komoku aina o Hawaii i loko o na na oihana ma Hawaii ke la ka mana o nui o ka olalo Hawaii ma ma ke komo ka olalo Hawaii i loko ki mo vahi a pau to the fields of play vehe o ka avale holo hanoho 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 makalaina 
Ali he me nui loa ia o kou manao ke laha maa mau no ka mea kou ola ana like me kia. Ike vona keiki me ke laha no lako ke kahi, ke laha ka maa mau no lako. We are also seeing the creation of jobs in the workforce outside of education created for and by the speakers of Hawaiian language. Aloha mai kako o ka ea ala pa ike ia maki a lāpuli nei maki aloha o kou kako polo kalamu ole aloha vai i. O kia he ka a mai ka i keo ka mai ka i nou a hiki ke nana. Liili ke nana aku i waho a ka ke wehe oi nana oi i loko he ka anui ia. KTUH 90.3 Honolulu hui au hea o kou e na uivi o ka aina e na ho. Olelo Hawaii. Oh yeah, makale kela mau mana mana lima, ho makau kau nuki, ah kau telefon. Nice. Ah oh yeah, no lela. Today, Kiki can literally be taught from infancy to graduate school completely in the Hawaiian language, something that would be commonplace had we not been victim to a near obliteration of our native tongue. In the 19th century, Hawaii was one of the most literate nations in the world, with over 90% of its population able to read and write. Over 100 Hawaiian newspapers were in print. Hawaiian was the language of the land, permeating throughout communities, schools, churches, and businesses. In 1896, the territorial government banned Hawaiian in the classrooms, thus starting a chain of events that would slowly try to kill the culture through the outlaw of our most basic means of communication, our language. The sheer desire and will to bring back what had been so thoughtlessly ripped out of the mouths of our babes rest firmly on the shoulders of a group of pioneer parents. These forward-thinking individuals, many of them educators themselves, took the risk and faced head-on the challenges, sending their keiki to a school with an educational model never before seen in Hawaii. The challenges that bothered me the most was public opinion. Our children in emerging is probably getting a different kind of way of seeing the world, which is probably a broader sense of what tr true education is for me or where I, what I want my child to learn or how to learn. So we who work in education, we know the brain's like a computer. The more it hears, the more it's going to take in. And as we see with our friends in Europe who were raised speaking five languages, we can certainly raise our children speaking two. We're coming along, we made some strides, I think we need to do more, and I think we will. These parents led the way and set the example for their children to start the second generation of Hawaiian immersion students. Makie makie nui vao e hookomo i kaukai ka mahine i ka papahana kai kai puni makie kahi ano i a o o ya i ka olelo Hawaii i a o o ya ina kuleana na havi na Hawaii a lana komana o hiki ana ya ya ke komo i ke kahi ano papahana kai puni. Mai kapuna na leo a hiki kapuka ana a i kaika oya maka epekema maka maki makika mena mea like ole a i hiki a ke holo mua maka ole lo hawaii maka ole lo haole a hiki ke kula nui ua ho ko mo ka uma o keiki kapolo kola mu no ko mea aole hiki ia uke ko mo i ko mana o i na he hawaii oe pono e a wamo ke la maukuli ana pono e ole lo hawaii and the foundation laid by these parents is now allowing for a greater impact well beyond the classroom. No language, no culture, there's a major element of truth in that. Uh, when I came back uh, late that evening after spending the day at the school, I couldn't wait to, to, to kind of say, you know, I've seen a place that's kind of different, and I've seen a vision of what our society could look like in the future, and it's a good vision. I grew up in what was a bilingual household of Italian immigrant parents and family. It's always given me a profound appreciation of language because I can still see to this day my grandmother sitting by her little radio saying her rosary in Italian. The preservation of the language is so, so important for those people who can actually communicate in Hawaiian and, and can speak it. And, and I've been now a number of places. There's been a lot of conversation and I'll listen to it. Uh, how beautiful and how special and how rare, how rare so if we can celebrate that and help make it even maybe, it'll always be precious, but maybe a little bit less uncommon, and that would be a good thing. I would, in whatever small role we can play to help with that, I want to do that. I'm real clear about that. Though we've created a proven educational system that works to replenish our Hawaiian-speaking population, we must extend our reach to the masses. There are now a number of websites that cater specifically to the Hawaiian language speaking community, like ulukau.org, 
home to the searchable Hawaiian dictionaries and portal to a collection of Hawaiian language newspapers and Bibola.org, the virtual version of the Hawaiian language Bible. And we've also ventured into the mass media. It was very easy to say yes to. This March, Ahai Oleloola hit the CBS network airwaves on Sunrise on KGMB 9, a daily news segment in the Hawaiian language, a first for Hawaii. Our language, our native tongue, is now enjoying the attention it so rightly deserves. Why didn't we ever think of this before? It was that fundamental to think <laughs> in the year 2008 we would be recognized, or it would be novel even, that here we are as a, as a communication company, as, as, as Hawaii's oldest television station, and we're simply trying to honor the Hawaiian language because it was done so well and it is being done so well um, that I think it's, it's become very powerful. I'm very pleased to see that. Hayalalaola is a very, very special opportunity. It's not something that um, I think we've ever seen before, and it's probably not something that we'll see for a long, long, long time. This was kind of offered up as an idea, and then when they saw the success of the idea, they said, hey, why don't you stay? And we're going to look back on it as the one thing that spun this into a whole other realm. All the response that we've been getting from people who speak the language to people who don't speak the language, it's all been the same, that we're doing a good job. And I can only thank Punana Leo for that. And I'm glad it's gotten such a good response. And so we're hopeful that we not only can sustain this, we we'll, we'll plan on that, but look up for opportunities on how to grow it. It's something that you cannot put a price tag on. It's um, documenting our culture in our native language. So our work continues, guided by the principles that set us on the path to rediscovering our language. Eola Mo ko Olalo Hawaii. Okay, so uh, the, the Aha Punana Leo is the nonprofit organization that we established back in 1982. 1982. And it is through that nonprofit organization that we can really do a lot that we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have that entity. So uh, essentially, we are uh, partnering. Uh, government agencies like the university, uh, the Department of Education in Hawaii, and this private nonprofit uh, organization uh, together in revitalizing language from the preschool level up through the doctorate level at the university. So uh, this is part of the strategy of reestablishing language, that is using those things that are in place and uh, partnering together and having people work together rather than starting all over and try to establish something entirely different and entirely new. Now this uh, video was made three years ago. So um, we've developed our language uh, uh, program a lot further now. Uh, that TV program, broadcasting program, uh, now has become uh, uh, so big that they can't really keep up with the day-to-day -day, um, little segments they were doing in Hawaiian and they're doing other documentaries and uh, training young people in uh, the broadcast, um, indigenous language broadcasting in Hawaiian. So uh, it's 
branched out a lot more. It's a lot more opportunity in that area for um, uh, young people who want to get into the field. I think, I think after seeing that, it might be overwhelming because looks like we have a whole lot. So I, it's good to go back. <laughs> Um, and before I get to um, this part, to say that when we first started our first, um, I remember when I first went into teaching Hawaiian language, you only had three students in my class <laughs> that I was teaching. This is a university class. And then when we had our first preschool, we had to go out and scour the town. And there are a lot of Hawaiians in Hilo to find, even find uh, children to start our, our little um, language nest preschool. So. And, you know, when we started, then we moved on. We made a combined K-1 and, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, so don't think that we started really big. We started really tiny, but tiny things can grow. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, when we were looking for those first parents to start the Punanaleo Ohilo, uh, we, went, we were at Penny's one day. This is like in 1984. So, okay, we got to you know, find some people. So we're in Penny's in the children's section, and I looked across, <laughs> and then there was in the cards, cards, this lady and her husband holding their son. I thought, perfect, he's the same age as our son, Huli Lao. So he says, go over there and talk to them. <laughs> so I said, okay, all right. So I went over there, I said, hello, hi. And I, I mean, we're not even originally from Hilo. You know, we're, we're from Honolulu, so we don't even, know them. So, <laughs> hello, we're, uh, my name is, you know, Kaunoi Kamana, and we're going to be starting these schools and uh, preschools, and we're going to uh, be using only Hawaiian language in these preschools with the children. And there's nothing like it now. And uh, anyway, we're going to have a small meeting, and here's my name, and I write it on a paper, and uh, my number, and uh, the meeting will be at X o'clock at a certain place. Well, anyway, long story short, she's one of our main parent uh, leaders in our administrative office at the Punana Leo today, and now she has three grandchildren. Her, uh, that son that she was carrying is, I don't know, he must be 6'5", and he has three children, and all of his three children are back into this kind of education. But like Tilo was saying, uh, we didn't have any money at all, just the thought. We have to do something other than second language learning to impact lang uh, our, our language. And that was with the Maoris at the very same time in New Zealand, put your babies with your old people and let them stay together every day for a long period of time. And we were all together graduate school at Manoa at the time and they hadn't started. It was in 1983 and we thought, okay, we just talked with our little group of people and go for it, okay? And people would say, well, you don't know anything about preschool. Well, we'll find out, you know, what's the most expensive one in Hawaii and why are people paying so much money for that school? Go take some of those classes, figure it out and just take what we think is Hawaiian and then make it ours, you know? And um, get families together to cut and paste, clean up, rip out rugs, clean toilets, make snacks and, um, really rally together and make everybody uh, believe that um, I am important and, and I can do simple things that are you know, really a, a big deal for the school. And with that attitude, and we still have that same attitude today, and uh, we've had the, the good fortune of having funding with a lot of hard work, and, um, and then also ra rallying these agencies together. I mean, that was a big task, I'm sure you can imagine. I mean, government. Let's go to the next picture. Oh, no, that's yeah, forward. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So Pila can talk about, about po the politics. In 1978, CONCON -Con that made the Hawaiian language uh, an official language of our state. So Hawaii is the only state that has two official languages. So th th these are like little stepping stones, you know, one, and then and you well step on that one. And Ironically, even though it was official language, it's illegal to use it in school. <laughs> so anyway. And we had to change that law too. And yeah. higher education, as much as w the nest is really important, we had to train people as second language speakers to become teachers and parents and 
And uh, the main thing is to force yourself to use the language. That's what we had to do ourselves. We were teachers, and yet we didn't even speak to each other in Hawaiian or outside of class, only to elders at first. And then we had to overcome our hypocrisy, and that was rough. But we did it. And the same thing, it's easier and easier the more you get going. Well, right. the, the thing about that is you have to uh, make yourself do it. And it's not easy. So if if you want your children, you know, growing child speakers to be able to to speak Hawaiian, you have to be that example for them before they're born. Because once they're born, they're not going to be waiting for you to really acquire the language. So you need to really uh, discipline yourself, and and then it gets better over time. Yep. And so this is an example of our graduation ceremony at our high school. Um, and we have been involved in politics and joined with other people, and including people here and in other states to try to change laws. There are lots of national barriers, but you can still move forward. Okay, and then we have some pictures of the children in our laboratory school. Um, there's over, if you count the preschool kids, there's over 300 children. Uh, at, at our site, because there are 11, um, Punanaleo preschool sites across our state, and wherever those sites are, there are elementary schools and uh, intermediate schools, but they're all structured very differently. So he's referring to our uh, main site in Hilo. But our Punanaleo preschools that are nonprofit ones is the basis of the whole system. The parents do that. So we have obstacles, time and language deaf, we heard that from Tony. Change the law, learn Hawaiian, get going. Don't know that much about it, start with young children and grow. Okay, and so we also learned from the elders and they didn't reject English and so we don't reject English. We, in fact, we want our children to speak better English than everybody and we have uh, Pidgin and Creole in Hawaii but it's English Pidgin and Creole. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, oh, I think it's important. They thought we were gonna do poorly academically. Did I mention this? It's really important, I think, because Everyone assumes that children that go to this kind of schooling will not do well academically. You're making a sacrifice, and the culture is language is really, really more important, and we thought that, we still believe that, but that doesn't mean you can't do well academically. So for our laboratory school, since our first graduation in 1999, we've had 100% high school graduation, 80% going on to college. They're all native Hawaiian children. Yeah, and they're also children from not strong economic backgrounds because most of the people who are more well-to-do say they don't want to risk their children failing what, what I told you. So 70%, 72% free and reduced lunch status. They're not the well-to-do group in the Native Hawaiian community. That 72% is at our school and typically at other schools also. Yeah. So mahalo, thank you very much. Okay, mahalo, thank you very much. <coughs> Does anybody have any uh, question or any uh, issue or something they'd like to bring up for, where did Tony go? Tony had the baby. Oh, there's Tony, okay. For Tony or uh, the two of us. Yes. And all the, the major, the major island. islands. So Hawaii, Maui, Molokai, Oahu, and Kauai. And are there opportunities for scholars to attend schools, to learn the language, even though we are not native Hawaiians? Yeah, these schools are public schools. It has nothing to do with being Hawaiian, native Hawaiians. Uh, the fact of the matter is that over 90% of the children who attend are Hawaiians, but anybody can attend. Uh, if you are uh, if you live in Hawaii, you have two choices, English medium or Hawaiian medium education. <coughs> Mike, um, same thing with uh, university classes, it's all open. But the problem, I think maybe part of the reason that mostly Hawaiians go is because, again, people thought that it wasn't going to be that academically successful, that's why. The other thing is we require the parents to learn, they have to do a Hawaiian language class, they have to uh, do work, uh, clean up the 
school grounds, everything like that, because uh, as Tony mentioned, we don't have a lot of money, but we do have muscles and you can work a room and clean a toilet. So um, there's a lot of extra work in it besides that. And we don't just advertise it either. We just, any anybody who comes can come, but it's not like we try to recruit students. We just, it's okay. with your small group of people and you don't know what's happening with other people are we doing a good job or not you know because it can get pretty crazy and discouraging so it's good to meet other people and 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 get encouragement that way yes mother was one of the uh, beginning uh, beginnings of teaching language and they, you know, her peers were against her for doing that. So we have to start someplace. Uh, her mother, when she'd come into the home and you mean, you'd hear the language and of course she would hear uh, some commands or silliness or, you know, whatever. But also on the Filipino side, very little because daddy was away from, but on the native side, with, with mother and grandmother, it just brought tears to my eyes to, to know that I'm a part of that. Mm -hmm. that that's the real, you know, where you came from, so you know where you are and where you're going, that's what I say. This in our warm springs, we have the three languages of we are not aware. Uh, I'm involved in the key to go over the law school, which is our heritage. And, you know, of course we have other, you know, other native, you know, but it's what was hot in your home. Uh, this is the beginning that uh, it's, it's a real challenge. You know, when we started with three and what now we're looking to fill the last of the two of the eight spots. And, you know, my grandson, I'm, you know, it, it's like, call and see how you coordinate between immersion to go back into Head Start. You know, that, you know I, I really, really want him to be there. And it's he's the captain and he's teach. And so, you know, we're wanting to begin. This is the beginning. And to know that 
we want to do it for Cheeks and Nimble. And we did a new program this summer that, you know, that is the tears that we're teaching the teachers. The teenagers now are going forward. And, you know, so that's the excitement of not dying, but staying alive. So I really appreciate, you know, everyone and everything that's being done because I told them when we're coming, I, you know, I didn't know what I was coming to, but I'm always willing. I was also a brother that teaches here, and you know, I got to see him in his birthdays in a couple of days. That was a game plus for me and to see my niece that's a student here. I said, we're coming here for a shot in the arm, you know, that helps us to go on, or shot in the push, if you want to call it that, but uh, you can all figure that out. <laughs> Uh, so truly, when we come together and we hear what a need is, and you know, we go out to do on our own to bring in, we're where you were, where you were talking about that we have the hope. But um, I'm laughing because other teachers are going, "Well, I haven't seen you. I have, you haven't been here. I haven't seen you." I said, "You have a sign on your door. Stay out. You know, teach. You know, talk only." to happen and what it's like, well, I'm huge, so, you know. <laughs> I can go in and observe and watch and, you know, I need to go and do that uh, because we're all one people, so the tribe is confederated tribe to come through. So I really, you know, I thank you for for your presentations and I hope and pray I can come back on Friday and Saturday too. So. Yes. The spirit of understanding that what we have is something that is valuable, very valuable, is something new for people. And sometimes our own people are the skeptics and they're very critical, but once they see it, like the children or they hear, they see with their own eyes, I mean, that's it. That's the proof right there and they're touched and they see that um, it is something that takes them back personally to their own families. So. We're not trying to compete with each other, or my grandma knew more than your grandma. You know how that goes. <laughs> so, no, it's not about that. No, it's about us. It's about us and our and our language. Yeah, and in that we contribute. Actually, in Hawaii, oh, I believe that we this kind of work really can contribute positively to English education. So, uh, they don't know it yet, but. Yes, I mean, there are lots of people in other countries who do fabulous things in education um, that are teaching through languages other than English. And um, so I think for us as um, Hawaiians, we have a lot to contribute, especially in Hawaii, to English um, education uh, for our children in Hawaii. <coughs> you know, and I know that you're still this fight too. Um, the effort to get Hawaiian offered as a foreign language in high school so that, that everybody was a foreign language, you know, foreign language. That's true, but the, to get to be, have it accepted for credit and to go to college is something. And I understand that now you're doing this with Chinook Wawa and maybe others. So, yes, and we have it offered in the. Um, Public schools, not every public school has it. Um, and also in private schools, uh, in the community colleges, we're very um, in a different situation. We only have one language and it's very, it's out there as like on the street names and things different than here. But um, still, uh, those students in the high schools and in the college are the ones who become the teachers for these emergent kids. So we, we say emergent is really important, but the people who are really carrying the ball are those kids who are in those, those schools. And we're not giving them enough attention right now because we put so much effort into making this thing. So I mean, it's hard to balance everything. But they're coming to the university and they're learning more and more Hawaiian and becoming the teachers. So they're crucial, those classes. This kind of education uh, affects every level of Hawaiian language instruction at every level too. So it's Good. Yes, um, I've spent a lot of time in the Louisiana French immersion schools, and a lot of the teachers told me that 
they want to integrate the local Louisiana French culture, but because of the curriculum that they have established by the state in science, math, and social studies, that they weren't successful in integrating the local culture. And it looks like that you are trying to integrate the Hawaiian culture into your curriculum, but how are you doing that when you have the same state standards curriculum in science, math, and standardized testing that you have to achieve? Where are you integrating this Hawaiian culture in the uh, curriculum? We're smiling. <laughs> We're smiling. Okay, that's a big question. That's a big question. Well, at the most fundamental level, um, we believe that the language is the culture. So when you're using language, you should be using it in a cultural way all the time, every day. So uh, you don't have a class on culture. Everything is culture. So uh, 1.2 for us with Navahi is uh, we make a distinction between Hawaiian immersion education and Hawaiian medium education. And Hawaiian medium education is where everybody speaks, the teachers, the staff, the people in the office, the administration, everybody speaks. Immersion, it could be just the teacher, just, uh, and the students, and then to varying degrees depending on the, on the class. So uh, the political side of uh, making curriculum, standardized testing is much more complicated and it requires that you be very, very creative and very, very, um, what is the word? Hard-headed. Yeah, hard-headed. <laughs> and uh, you can see the line, you know, yes and no. Um, uh, we'll do that or no, thank you, we won't do that. So this is the um, choice of parents. So one example would be um, standardized testing in English before we actually introduce English to the children. So we don't introduce English as a course until the children are in the fifth grade. And by then, many of them are already reading on their own because they're learning Hawaiian reading prior to that. So when the uh, Department of Education says you will implement the third grade online state test, then the, the parents typically will say, well, no, we, we don't want our children taking that. And actually, any parent in the state of Hawaii, and I'm sure in your state also, I, I mean, I don't know, but maybe in your state also, you can say, I don't want my child taking the SAT test. That's your right as, as a parent to say that you don't want your child to be taking a particular test. So, but people don't know that. People don't realize that. People think, oh, oh, we have to take this test. Or we have to do this because everybody says we have to do that. But everybody has a choice. And so in our case, uh, for parents, they don't want their children tested in a test, a test that doesn't use the language of instruction. So we have to be up on you know, the rights of indi individual parents. We cannot, as a school, say we're not taking the test. We cannot do that, but individual parents may say that. So basically, they don't just don't take the test, and if the state says you, the curriculum is this, we say we'll teach that math, we'll teach that science, but we teach it how we want. So we have gardens behind the school, we have pigs, we have uh, things that are traditional Hawaiian cultural things uh, in our school, uh, but part of it is just being hard head and uh, state the people really, even the administrators, even in Washington, D.C., they support having the Hawaiian culture and language alive, but they're worried about the academics. So the strange thing is we just say, well, we have the right, uh, human right to value the language and culture more than uh, going to college, more than uh, being a business person or whatever, that it's a human right to maintain your language and culture and try to stop us. Close our school. Try it. Right. So far, nobody did it, and worse yet, we're doing better academically than they're doing with their, the people who are following the thing are not doing well in school. Again, we have 100% high school graduation, 80% going to college, come tell us we're failing. They can't do that. So we just do what we want. 
<laughs> and it might be wrong, but so you try it one time, and maybe this isn't the right path. You got to change a little bit. Nobody's perfect. You're always learning, but that's basically what happened. Yeah, and, and we're always trying to strengthen it. So when we say something, you know, we don't want to do that. We have a clear idea of what we are actually doing. You know, it's not like, no, I don't want to do that. You know, try to shut us down. We're saying that because we know we're actually doing something that they, they would like to do themselves, probably. You know, something that they would value also. Yeah, we did. We made our own tests and have them made valid and reliable. We we set up our own system. You know, we have something that we can show them. Um, curriculum based measures um, in reading and, and math and um, in both English and in Hawaiian. So we have our own system of um, assessment. And then when they get up into intermediate and high school, then they're taking the um, uh, well, like SAT, PSAT um, in the ninth grade, and actually in high school, we begin sending them to the university when they're in their juniors and seniors as a class. We have very small classes, 12 or so, and we send the entire class over to the university earlier because our, our um, day is longer. We have more classes uh, from the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th. And 11th grade so that when they get to the 12th grade they have a half a day that they can actually go to the university uh, and get credit there. Hi. Hi. Um, I, my name is Richie and um, my junior year of high school I went to uh, live in Mexico for a year as an uh, exchange student and so I know firsthand what you guys are talking about about um, being bilingual and having that help you in school and having it be just like a really great tool, especially in a country where you know there is no official language and we do have an opportunity to learn as much as we can from all the different fragments of society that we have. Um, I'm taking Sahoptin right now. Um, I wasn't really planning on it, but it just kind of happened. Um, and I'm kind of curious um, because for me personally, growing up in uh, a small town where there's not much diversity, um, there's not many new ideas. I got a chance, I got a plane ticket out for an entire year to go and expand my mind in a new environment, a, you know, totally different land, um, which is something that you guys have. You're, you're blessed with that. Um, Hawaii is very different from, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> from the continental United States um, in a lot of different ways. You have a strong culture, which is something that's been taken away from um, a lot of indigenous groups here. Um, so have you guys, thought about um, any sort of like sister school program to get um, people who may not have, you know, may not in their home communities have access to an immersion school for another language and they may not be able to travel outside of the United States of America, but they want to, you know, have that opportunity. Um, have you thought about setting up anything like that for maybe an exchange program or um, language schools for, uh, I don't know, well, what sort of related to that is some communities, even though we have it throughout the state, there are some that are kind of far away from something, and we've had people send their children to Hilo, to where we live, and stay with families or go to school. So we've had that. Uh, that's a little bit different than what you're talking about. We've also, there's other immersion schools, and so one of the ideas is to uh, exchange I mean, Native American language immersion schools are exchanged between the Blackfeet and the Hawaiian or, or, the, or overseas New Zealand. We've had a New Zealand student come and go to school at Navahi, a Maori student. So uh, we've talked about these things, but uh, part of the thing is, uh, in fact, somebody like me, I want them all to leave the school and to appreciate it because they, they're in the school all this time, you know, these kids, and they don't realize that uh, other kids don't have this opportunity, they don't know what it's like to go to another type of school, and so if they do, they'll appreciate more what they're getting, so. But the mothers don't want their children to leave home, you know, but I don't, I want them to. Eighth graders. Yeah, I was saying, why don't we send all the eighth graders all over the place, you know. But anyway, um, it's a great idea, but we're not there yet.
resources in that language, so um, literature to teach children and then like third, fourth, and fifth graders how to read with, or textbooks, you know, there's a whole industry of textbook publishers for English language instruction. And I was just wondering if that was an issue with Hawaiian language, a lack of materials, and if it was an issue, how you dealt with it and how you faced it, the production of those resources. Does that make sense? We had a lot of uh, materials from the 1800s uh, when Hawaiian was the medium of education then, but uh, not too much of that transfers over to <laughs> 1984 when we started the preschool. So we had to, um, actually we had Sister Lazor come from the Mohawk um, Nation uh, when we started our Punanaleo schools because they were doing immersion in Canada. And um, she was a Catholic nun and oh, she was so much fun and she'd come work with us day and night and cut and paste and show us what she was doing with her language and, and she was a big help at that time. And um, like I said earlier, going and finding out what other preschools do and, and just learn on our own, come back and, and make new materials. And then in Hawaiian we have a lot of music and a lot of songs, so I mean that's just a lot of uh, resources um, in terms of music. And and songs and um, dancing also for uh, in Hawaiian. And um, so we just pretty much used uh, what we could make on our own. And when we had the opportunity by our state superintendent to begin the K-1 uh, pilot class in 1987 for those kids who were going into kindergarten, first grade, um, we, t we s had said to him that the Punanaleo would make all the materials and that he need not worry about making any materials just pay for the teacher. We even find the teacher for for um, for the class for those two classes, and we just worked all summer and and did the math and 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 made sure that we could have materials for those children that showed up that that fall in the K one class on on Oahu and and in Hilo. So um, that's how we we do things, you know, like that. But there's always there's always a habit that teachers have in Hawaiian immersion over the years where they say there's just not enough materials, there's just not enough materials. But you know, it, uh, for us in Hawaiian, we have such a wealth of uh, literature because our old people wrote and wrote and wrote and we have hundreds of newspapers, you know, there, but they're all sleeping and waiting for somebody to come and look, you know. So when a teacher says we don't have enough um, materials, what they're saying is that somebody's not preparing it for me Somebody is not putting it into a form that I can I can use, you know, with with small children or, or or even at intermediate. But but I think that's become less and less so when teachers now know that they if they want something, they have to go after it and get it and and have the uh, the knowledge and the skill to transpose it and use it in a way that's appropriate for their um, grade level. That's the skill of the immersion or the Hawaiian medium. Um, teacher, that ability. So there are all kind of levels of um, <coughs> curriculum development. Uh, and that's not to say that we haven't set up a system to try to provide materials. And we've, I think we've advanced pretty far, but the basic idea of no, just because you have nothing doesn't mean you cannot start. And just because uh, so-and-so has a fancy, nice book, that doesn't mean you can't write something on just a piece of lined paper and write it, and the child just be happy. In fact, more proud that you made that and yourselves. And people a lot of times say, well, you want to have as nice quality in Hawaiian as in English because they'll look down at No, we don't look down where it's a source of pride to us that yeah, we were able to make it ourselves. So um, that's... Um, for the, for the, the parents, as part of the yeah. parent, uh, they need to take classes, the parents. So they, uh, you just have a collection of pictures, of course, Pictures. Everybody has pictures, and then you make a sentence, and a sentence, and then you make a cover, and then you have a book. You know, and that's those were the first kinds of books we had that parents made. So you you're teaching language, it's personal. When it's in the classroom, that child sees that's me. That's oh, that's my story. That's my family. Or that that's you know us at school. So those kinds of books are you can't buy that. And parents learn and children learn. And the teachers learn about the families also and the relationship between the people as they're working on these things. 
you know, when you order from somebody else, you're not working together. So think of that as an opportunity, really, to work together and you're producing something of value. I'll go first and then we'll go second. <laughs> um, well, like I said, our in our school, now we heal plenty of food. Uh, the classes are small. And they're in there for a long time, from a lot of them from preschool and up. So they're being, uh, they're using language and they're understanding language and their relationship culturally and knowledge culturally in a perspective that we say is a Hawaiian perspective. And so um, those kinds of values, you know, people talk about values, the values, you know, work together, um, aloha, you know, the, and they make posters, put those words on there, you know, but those things don't mean anything if you're not actually practicing that every single day. And the teacher, this is the hard part, the adults, the children are great. I mean, they, they, they pick up everything, but adults have a, have a problem staying focused on being good role models for children and for other adults. And so we have to help each other, you know, stay positive about these kinds of things. So uh, what we've noticed is that when they uh, come through this kind of education, like these girls right here, these girls are, um, I think they're like fourth graders at the time. So now they're seventh graders, seventh and eighth graders. Um, they, they had it then. So w at each grade level, they have an understanding of Hawaiian for that grade level. And as they go up, you know, seventh and eighth and ninth grade, they become very, um, seventh and eighth and ninth grady about it. You know, you can't tell them anything and they rather talk English behind your, be they hide and, you know, but at least they hide. <laughs> <laughs> so when, then when they didn't hide, we tell them, you know, the first students, they always would hide at least, you know, they have some respect for teachers when we're walking around instead of just talking English in front of um, their teachers. But if you don't help them understand their behavior, they just, They'll just behave that way. So these kinds of ways of making things right as we go along produces a young person who um, understands um, themselves better and then kind of takes on a responsibility um, in their own way um, later. So every culture, we all have our own understanding of what that is. And so we all want our children to have that sense of um, people say valuing um, their own identity, but it's not so intentional like my identity because then it's not what it is. It just is a natural part of who we are as a people. And like um, uh, the video said, oh, you know, this is something that will be, um, uh, this is the way that we were raised and now the young children are gonna s be raised in the same way. It's not anything new. That's that kind of thinking. Rather than, I can speak Hawaiian, but how come you can't speak Hawaiian? You know, I went to this school and I'm Hawaiian and I can speak Hawaiian. And then you're Hawaiian and how come you can't speak? No, but that could very well happen if that's the way they're being nurtured. So every, Every culture has its own way of communicating what is important. And our language tells us what those things are. It's in there. It's in there. In the systems of the language itself. So, um, yeah, I, actually the most, um, um, who's that, Oigi? I guess he's the most uh, 
what the, the, per, the one student who went to the Punana Leo, and he's 30 this year also, but he left when he was in the 10th grade, and then he uh, came, what is, um, he moved to Utah. oh yeah, Utah, to go to school with his family, and then he graduated, and then he uh, went away to school, and he now has a doctorate uh, in at Oxford, and he um, works there. So we had an article in our, our uh, newspaper in Hilo, from the Punanaleo o Hilo to Oxford. <laughs> Everybody thought that was funny, you know, from the preschool to Oxford. So um, they're just kind of driven to seek out, you know, what they think is important. Yeah. I, <coughs> I know minorities in schools is a big thing, but they don't think of themselves as minorities, I don't think. Um, because in other schools, Native Hawaiians are doing the poorest in, in our state. And so um, I don't think they see anything like that at all. It's just, in fact, I think they have the, part of the reason that they continue on is because they get this kind of, same thing like the people who are in these language classes or whatever, they feel they gotta, they gotta carry something because their parents did it and the teachers did it. So they'll be letting 